Hey everybody, Neon here, another analysis video. This is a game between Sixo and Mr. Yagoot. I was checking out some of the stuff that was uh, going on in different channels, seeing if I could find some good replays to do with you guys. I was checking out Sixo's stuff, and I came across this one against another high-profile Hearthstone personality, so I thought it would be a great one to cast for you and to talk about some of the interesting decisions that are going on in the game. Before we get into it, though, I want to remind you, check out the submission page if you find games that are like this that you thought were sweet. I would love to review them, and I would love to talk about them um, with you and learn about them to together. Also, if you have feedback, be sure to send that to me. I always want to get better and develop new stuff for the channel, and of course, check out Ink Gaming. They are the sponsor of a lot of the stuff that goes on with, with the A-Space and that help supports everything going on. Let's get into the game. Of course, this is also taken from somebody else's uh, stream, so you can find the VOD link below to Sixo's stream, which is what I got this from. He is, of course, here playing against Mr. Yagoot. Both of these guys, if you're not familiar, are well known within the Hearthstone community and have a number of accolades to each of their names. Right now, Miss Avernus is coming out on the right-hand lane. You'll actually see two of those come out on the right-hand lane just in this first turn, which, uh, as you can imagine, has a pretty big impact on the game and really kind of turns even the uh, Ogre Magi into an imposing threat really, really quickly. This is something, though, that I have really noticed in my time of watching some constructed games. Uh, not that this is normal, because this is a really, really good start, uh, no matter what, but it's just the idea of, like, these cross-lane effects, so, and there's a lot more of that in constructed games because they're so powerful. So here we've been able to really affect the right-hand lane already, and even having improvement on the center lane as well. So now the question is, where does Kana go? This is a little bit strange because Kana usually wants to go into the Miss of Avernus lane. Um, obviously, she brings the creeps with her every turn after the one that she's deployed. So getting those bonuses stacked on as many creeps as possible is obviously pretty dope. But uh, the ogre is already there meaning that you'll only have access to blue spells in your right-hand lane and only access to green spells in your other two. That's, like, not the end of the world, though. It, it, you, you can survive w with that, but um, it's still a little bit awkward. Uh, I mean, your hand right now is awkward as it is. That's another thing, too, that I noticed very much in watching some of the constructed games that I've been... Uh, looking at recently is that the speed at which you run through your cards is much faster. So having card advantage mechanisms like the Unearth Secrets is especially important. By the way, you'll notice that the clip is sped up just a little bit. Um, I mean, I think that this is just something I'm trying for this one, so give me some feedback on that. I'm really interested to hear that. Give me feedback on, like, on anything in the comments. So I, I always want to know what people like and uh, how to improve it better. But right now, this center lane is clearly all work, look, already looking like a problem. We have some, some serious business here, just going to basically spend some mana on that uh, little, little buff there. I kind of like going the Rosalie Druid there just to try to soak up some damage and slow things down. Like, obviously, you're not winning that lane. Like, I mean, unless you find a way to annihilate it, like, really soon. In which case, you could actually do something like the, uh, play that out, the, um, the, the uh, Roseleaf Druid in ramp to six mana, and that maybe you can set up an annihilation as soon as next turn, especially with something like a, a Blink Dagger. I guess with both of your blue heroes in the right-hand lane, that's really hard to do. But uh, still, that's something that I think that it would have been worth considering, especially given how little impact that Arm the Resistance really had. We did pick up a Blink Dagger, though, in the shop, which is very handy um <laughs> the uh, draw ranger de definitely finds the safest lane to, to be in it does not want to be in that center lane for sure because that's uh probably going to get annihilated at some point in the near-ish future that right lane too that's looking like problems as well it's gonna be annihilated probably on the other side we have the zeus there that uh would just move into that lane on the six mana turn and there's also just a really hard pressure on annihilating a lane like that because it can just get so out of hand so quickly because of those Mists of Avernus. Like, you're doing 10 damage with those two creeps that you have in the lane that's just the ones that are are free there on the right. So, 
pretty spooky stuff and i can understand why uh wanting to set that up as early as possible seems pretty attractive but right now you you see him considering whether he wants to deploy the romesk blessing in the right hand lane um even if it is annihilated which is what it looks like is going to be happening here that bonus of health does sustain through death but uh decides not to do it for now instead he uses the rose leaf druid to jump up the power count just a little bit it also is worth remembering for the power count math that the uh, stars align only bumps you up to power functionally so you you are going to have access to one mana less than what your max power is going to be after you use it so you you couldn't actually use the emissary of the quorum under those situations the blink dagger here also could be deployed once again in order to set up something in another lane with the like and just totally ditch that that center lane if you wanted to um decides to he does want to use the Romesque Blessing, but you can also just wait for that for, for now. There's no no pressure. It's only that you need the damage from the, the Blink Dagger, etc. So I'm... I, I mean, at this point, too, I think that Yagut is going to be sensing that there might be something up in this center lane as well, even though it's going to be a little bit difficult to get a blue here into that lane, uh, especially since they're both going to die right here. Exactly. We have that... Annihilation, as I think is pretty obvious here, <clears throat> kind of, so yeah, it was 14 damage, not not 10 damage, so it, was four, it was 10 damage at the start of the turn, but the, the extra buff made it all the way to 14, so although it might seem like a little bit weird to nuke a lane like that where you're only going to be taking damage from two creeps, like, those creeps were, were pretty big, so it, it does, I think, make a lot of sense to do that, but it, I mean, it just shows you how much trouble that right lane is right now. You could say something like well maybe you should just ditch it maybe you should just sack it but this is very much the kind of situation where you can get anciented you you can have your your, your second uh tower die there very easily and uh th this is definitely something that i mean i talked a little bit about in some of my draft focused content is that there are t like there are some times that there are lanes where you are you, you can get ancient like there's some matchups some some games some draft decks that you that can kill your ancient and there's something that really can't and in the uh, constructed format it's actually a lot more common to to see that you have the firepower that's available for it. not that it's not more common than it's going to actually happen as much but people have to respect it all of the time because like, like like just like look at this deck i mean i mean i guess that both of these decks very much have the capacity because they have these multiplicative effects with drow rangers etc that they can set up some some nonsense but uh but yeah i i think that this is something you really really have to be very conscious of um the question now is what does Sixo do in order to manage the various lanes it's possible to use the blink dagger to go to the right lane and then start deploying some stuff there now that that was cleared out by the previous annihilation which seems like a pretty attractive plan uh actually yes yeah, so this of course is a, a good play as well so what he does here is he first plays out a stars align then jams the emissary of the quorum buffs up the entire team to give for instance the Trion protector that plus two plus two before they head off to that right lane so that's just very clean sequencing here and even the the tower is still going to go down under those conditions so yeah just considering it a little bit further trying to decide whether they want to play out the uh cape the cloak beforehand i think the cloak to do it now it you might think like okay why would you do it now why would we, like not just wait till later like who actually really cares i think that in this case it's it's correct to do it now because it means that if your opponent does anything in the center lane then they give you initiative which you're planning to probably deploy a blue hero into that center lane f soon like like they're, they're going to like that's going to be an important part of your game plan so that you don't get your ancient killed there i think that that so i think that that makes a lot of sense to do this now and means that if your opponent does play anything at all in that center lane then you can regain initiative and punish them down the road this is something too that like when you have high impact plays like annihilation you are playing for initiative right now in lane one for 
lane to initiative on the following round, right? Like, that's kind of crazy. Um, I mean, you, you do have to forego doing anything in the right lane if that's what you want to end up doing, but at least you have that option that's kind of available. And I, I'm, I'm personally partial to it. I, I think that if uh, memory serves, Sixo does not decide to go the, the same way. I'm not sure on whether or not it's correct or not, but uh, definitely you you do see how those layered initiative plays can play out. Having that other blink dagger, though, means that you have the possibility of moving that lichen over to the right lane if you wanted to. Just kind of really show face up and like, yeah, no, I have an Annihilation, I have a Sweeper in my hand, and try to force your opponent into doing something, um, you know, maybe play, they're forced to play awkward like this. This deployment, by the way, feels strange to me. Um, when you have access to so much mana, I feel like you aren't excited to deploy, like, because you have the Agam of Sanctum on, on Mr. Yagut's side, of, of playing out a dimensional portal here, like, what are you accomplishing? Like, the, the damage that you get out right now doesn't actually matter, and you have pretty good reason to believe that you're going to get swept up. And dimensional Portal is a really high value spell. Like, it really is, honestly, I think one of the best cards in the the deck of uh, Mr. Yagut's deck. Probably both decks. I would imagine that both decks are playing um, Dimensional Portal. I don't actually have the deck lists in front of me of what they have, but the it, it I, I don't know it, it feels like th this does put a lot more pressure on getting anciented <clears throat> um but we do also see here just a, a we're playing in terms of the stars align stuff it just feels like there was a little bit of a maybe he was planning to do one thing and decided to change his mind like he had a setup here where he could have gone for an emissary of the quorum um especially with that agnum sanctum it really helps set that up but uh, it seems that he just decides to sort of shift gears here because I don't think that he uses very much of the remainder of his mana. I have I would have to go through kind of carefully and see how the um, the the mana usage really all panned out to see if it was all necessary. But I don't really think that it actually. Yeah, it it was if you wanted to really maximize all of these plays. Um, but I don't think that it was particularly necessary. I guess so. There's a question of how, how much usage you're going to get out of that soon. That thunderstorm, though, by the way, that is quite the pickup. It is very, very good here. That uh, a drow ranger does not look like it's long for this world. Just sitting in front of two hungry boys, looking to set up some some kills. What do we do with the Romesh blessing in hand, though? Are we going to spend this right now? Just buff things up even further like i mean your guys are just absolutely massive already like do you want them to be larger um i mean i don't think that you're gonna get too much more value out of it so like why not oh this this play this play i like by the way yeah just play him out see if you can get lucky because getting the the drow ranger off the table in this lane actually does represent a good deal of value because you want to limit their ability to gust because if they if they do have access to that card, it will make a, a really big difference in how future turns can play out. But yeah, that right lane just all over again, just once again, like instantly becomes this big problem because of those mists of Avernus. Ignite though has actually been just like a superstar in this game been keeping that middle lane from getting totally batshit insane. Uh, in this situation, it's possible to deploy one of your blue heroes into the left lane and then blink them into the right lane in order to deploy a sweeper. There, in some respects, I feel like that's a bit of a risk to do because especially you, like, there's a lot of ways in which you can get punished by uh, various sequences of plays uh, from your opponent here like for example if you um you play out one of your blue heroes into the left lane like i think that if, if memory starts with the actual final decision is yeah he goes left lane for the ogre magi right lane for the kana but imagine for instance in this setup we have the 
uh, yeah, so he goes here, and then both those heroes on Mr. Yagut's side go into the left lane, and then they, you are trying to set up a Blink Dagger into Annihilation or Blink Dagger into the Thunderstorm, and then you, they, but before you are able to do that, they annihilate you again. Like, that seems like real problems. Okay, a third Mr. of this is a This is a definitely <laughs> working out well for him. But yeah, so, the, and then there's also the Ignite, who just, just piling up those improvements in that mid lane. Or the right lane, rather. Also, when you don't have access, when there's no green hero in the middle lane, you're also not worried about getting gusted. Because you could imagine a play like you blink into the middle lane with the the ogre to set up that thunderstorm and then they they gust you like i in I, i'll spoil a little bit but there's no gust in this entire game that shows up but the, like I, watching this game you realize how much it can just blow out different situations your opponent has a plan and then it just like yeah big fat stop sign even when you have like contingency plans of like oh i'll have multiple blue heroes in order to play around just you know one removal spell it's like no it's just not good enough so it's i am i actually kind of feel like gust itself is a little bit overrated for draft i mean Dr drow ranger is insane because her passive is insane but gust itself is actually only mediocre in draft in my opinion in constructed though i am hard convinced that the card is nutty so we have the opportunity here to blink into the mid lane to set up one of those sweepers. Well, yeah, once again, just to, to emphasize that friggin' thunderstorm here has the possibility to just absolutely demolish everything that's going on in that center lane. Those card, that card draw, by the way, like on both sides, it has just been consistent and powerful and good. And part of the that's actually part of the reason why the thunderstorm is so good over the Annihilation because you keep that Ogre in the lane and you're going to be taking four damage. And, like, obviously you don't want to take damage, but, I mean, four is not that much when it's on an Ancient. So you're able to then draw an extra card, and that's really nice, given the fact of, like, how quickly he's been burning through his cards. An opponent has, actually has a pretty decent amount of card advantage at this point you've seen a lot of multicasts as well going off which is always nice for him but uh, a lot of that gets undone when it gets all swallowed up in one big thunderstorm and then okay so yeah he gets a thunderstorm too ogre is such a trip man the boy like he is a very good card just uh, i when i first saw him i was kind of like 25 eh, percent, you know like who, who really cares about that is like i i care i really really care but we get a nice fat thunderstorm off right here taking down a bunch of health gear but in some respects this also is a strong suggestion that they have multiple thunderstorms in hand because in that instance they didn't actually accomplish anything other than just softening the heroes up so i mean you know that they have another thunderstorm in hand now because of the um the the what we saw, like uh, the, the multicast that, that went off, but um, it, it is very much showing the fact that there might be an, even another one in hand. But right here, like once again, like what would happen if we had Gust? What would what would be going on here? What would <laughs> Jagu do? Just concede? I feel like he would have to. It's uh, it, there are just so many instances where you're really relying on being able to set things up. But right now, he is able to set up a second. Thunder God's Wrath. I should note, though, that this is... Uh, so we're going to see just a pass, I think, out of 6-0. There's uh, he, not a ton that he can do, but I think that actually he should be flipping the position of his scout, or his decoy, rather, with the Lycan. Because if he only did have that one Thunder God's Wrath in hand, like, and he just fired it off for, for value, then this ping kill that we get off of the special ability wouldn't have killed the the lichen uh because i think you, you are going to expect that they're going to be playing that second thunder god's wrath here it seems pretty good um so i think that that's a pretty good sign that uh that you should just flip them you know that it's probably coming so that's a good way to avoid that but here we, we do we have that option once again we could just flip things around in order to set up a 
big fat hit on the tower with the kana for example um in, in addition if you wanted to do that but he decides to just pass once again also i didn't mention about the leather armor that was purchased earlier in the game um i just don't really feel like it's done <laughs> well it's clearly not done anything uh, up until this point it's just set in the hand as as you can see but in a game like this particularly, where it's just very over the top, there's a lot of big plays happening back and forth, I just don't feel like leather armor is going to make a very big difference. It's usually going to be a little bit of a, you know, poopy play. Annihilation comes out. This, to me, almost seems like a little bit of an overreaction, especially given that you could save the, the Kana here. Um, I think that also it would have been possible to play out the unearthed secrets earlier in the turn. I mean, I think that at this point it's obvious that 6-0 is so far ahead that he can play super conservative. But that was, in, in some respects, a very strange way to play the turn. As of right now, by the way, all 9 out of 10 heroes are dead. One of them is being deployed right now. But in that turn, we had just absolute massacre. All 5 of... Sixo's heroes died. I mean, which tends to happen when you have uh, an annihilation and three copies of Thunder God's Graph, you know, gas in a turn. But you know, man, like this is also like just is worth emphasizing just how many haymakers, how many crazy plays you can see back and forth and back and forth in a constructed game that's at a high tier. Another activation of that Emissary of the Quorum. She has been absolutely representing that Quorum today, you know, bu buffing things up, getting things... Things just get so big so fast. I can't even get over it. It's just, like, I see it every time, and it's just like, man, everything's huge. Every Like, all of the heroes are, are oversatted already. And, like, I mean, yeah, it's like the eight mana turn. That's not like it's early game, but still, it's crazy. I do like the play of basically doing nothing there. Um, I mean, I would have liked to see a little bit more action uh, from the the other side of Mr. Yagut, but uh, it really is just something that you don't have to pull the trigger on a sweeper yet. The uh, Prey on the Weak is obviously not good in that lane. There were, there were no damage units, for example, so that all makes sense. It, the Prey on the Weak in this lane is extremely weak, though, like, it does absorb a little bit of damage um, on the tower, and that last little dog is going to get killed by the Ignite, which is, I mean, Ignite, one of the best counters to that, probably the best counter to that, honestly. Like, let's be real. And then just some dinky creep combat there on the right where the 5-4 creep just <laughs> eats the 2-4 the, the one. Um, yeah, so he did hold the Apotheosis Blade in the previous uh, turn. I didn't mention that. But um, it was a bit of a strange decision in, in my mind. Like, I mean, obviously getting the Apotheosis Blade activations off to destroy the items on a hero can be a pretty... A big deal in some situations but uh especially for the improvements there's not a lot of value improvements that are out on the opponent's side right now i mean i guess the agnum sanctums are pretty good but if you can get a clean hit off um it's good anyway i to me the real question is it depends on what else is in the item deck for six so like does he have any other big value attack items because it's probably mostly just health stuff it's probably just survivability stuff his his deck is very controlling oriented and value oriented so you just kind of want to keep your heroes on the battlefield for a couple of extra turns because you know, you don't really need to build in your own attack items into the deck so i there's a pretty good chance that it was just that it was the if you buy out your entire item deck, you just wouldn't have done anything. So I can respect saying, you know, like, yeah, we're just going to not bother with with that. This is a situation of deploying stuff, like, it feels like you could almost kind of go anywhere and your opponent is going to be boned. There's just a lot going on in all of these lanes. And this is also something, too, that I think that Sixo's done really, really well, is pushing all of the lanes to varying degrees and forcing Mr. Yagut to be stretched out from all these locations. Like, just been casually pushing this Ancient for a really long time. You've been 
uh, casually getting in like all this damage in the mid lane too is is very close to pushing down that third lane. Like when you have every one of the lanes going in at least reasonably in your favor, it just becomes impossible to make any decisions that feel good from the opponent's side. Now, Mr. Yagut is basically forced to have a... Actually, well, I mean, yeah, basically forced to have an Annihilation. It's, technically, there are other combinations of cards that keep him alive here, but uh, there's probably nothing else that wins him the game. But even then, he's still so far in the hole that, like, you know, why does it matter? So, considering the options, Emissary of the Quorum is up to a 1 billion 1 billion in, in size, from what I can see. Man, that card is, is messed up. I've played it a little bit in, in draft and stuff like that, and, just, and every time I just feel like, oh god, this is... Holy moly, she just goes places. You need to slay, like, that turn. <laughs> Immediately, before she gets one activation off. Because it just... It, it so snowballs out of the game. And especially when you have so many hero kills, and the, the heroes are deploying, you know, again, like, back and forth and back and forth just constantly. It's... Um, having they them so buffed and so modified in size to, to me it just makes it that much more dangerous because even if you do kill it in some point like juncture in the game then you're going to lose to those exact same heroes later blinking out of the left lane is a strong signal that there might be a super that's coming um so this gives the opportunity for Sixo to move out of that left lane as well. I mean, even if there isn't a sweep, like, he has to have a sweeper. And if he does, then the game goes on and you're still in an advantage. If he doesn't, they probably just die. Okay, so he does have the sweeper, though. Fair trade. Um, not even really a fair trade. It's definitely trade in, in, in Sixo's favor, all things considered there. But, you know, what it must be done. The, the Ignite also like low-key mvp of this game we have 47 damage onto that mid tower and that is it for yagut so hopefully you found that interesting there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in so hopefully you found that to, to be a fascinating game i thought it was a pretty interesting one myself i'm still learning a lot from the, the constructed stuff there's a lot going on there's a lot of bouncing back and forth between the different lanes and uh, this was a particularly interesting game partly because they had some high level Hearthstone personalities, but partly because just the decks were so powerful, too. Just, you know, with Thunder God's Wrath, like three of them in one round, Annihilations back and forth. Like, man, it was lots of haymakers going left, right, and center. But that will do it for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Be sure to check out the other analysis videos on the channel if you haven't had a chance already. I also have a lot of other content, like a, you know, podcasts and, and and other business. I did a recent video about hero positioning in, in draft, which I was really happy about. Check all of that out. It's uh, great stuff. Also, check out Ink Gaming. They're one of the sponsors for the channel and of the work that I do. And if you use this code ASPACE12 on the site, you can save 12% off your order. Thank you once again for joining me. Take care, everybody.